नमस्कार माई नेम इज सौरभ नंदा एंड वेलकम टू दिस टीचर्स डे स्पेशल सच कॉन्वर्सेशन एपिसोड इन टूडेज एपिसोड आई हैव इन्वाइटेड डॉक्टर रमन के अत्री फ्रॉम सिंगापुर डॉक्टर रमन इज एक्चुअली माई सीनियर फ्रॉम नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी जलंधर ऑल दो ही कंप्लीटेड हिज इंजीनियरिंग वे बैक uh in 1994 when my college was not known as nit but it was called the rec or regional engineering college now most engineers would go for corporate jobs or you know civil services or government jobs after completing their degree but dr raman decided to become a scientist at one of the national laboratories in the country there he quickly uh, switched over to technical training uh of uh, engineers and other technical staff and that particular institute uh had a collaboration with switzerland and that is where dr raman uh, left india went on to switzerland then ireland then various other parts of europe the us and currently he lives in singapore over the past 20 25 odd years of his corporate career he has done two doctorates he's written more than 20 books and what he teaches organizations is how their employees can learn better can keep up their expertise especially during this time when the technology changes so quickly and that is what the discussion is all going to be about what is the future of learning how is technology going to disrupt things what are the new opportunities over there and so many other questions please help me invite dr raman to the show hi dr raman how are you thank you very much sir thank you really appreciate for inviting me for a conversation appreciate it Oh, it's it's definitely my privilege, sir. In fact, I still remember the the uh, first message that you had sent me on LinkedIn, where you said, uh, "Hi, Saurabh. This is uh, Raman, and I'm an ancient uh, alumni <laughs> of the same college." So <laughs> yeah, it's twenty five years. I would say, you know, I passed from that college, so it kind of becomes ancient, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> that was hilarious, sir. And that's where I would like to begin the interview as well. Um, yeah, certainly. Now I believe I personally believe that every engineer in India has a particular story why they joined engineering. What is your engineering story sir and please tell us. <laughs> okay, my engineering story in fact my engineering story has been very very interesting and in fact um sometime when I tell it, it turns out to be quite surprising as well. Um so you know that I graduated in 94 Right, it's a twenty-five years from now. So we are talking about the times when uh, Google was uh, founded. Uh, I think it was founded in about a year later or something. So the older guys uh, would know that uh, it was a time when an engineering degree was thought that to be a ticket to highly paid corporate job, or someone could get into you know public service companies at that time at a decent salary. Mm-hmm. But uh, my fate, I think, was written differently. um there were times uh, in the campus when they, those companies would come in you know you just just need to kind of knock their door based on their academic standing and i think i was pretty a average student and logically an average student would you know they will uh, and go for these placement agencies i don't know what it was in my mind i never appeared for any of these campus interviews so uh, that's uh, kind of the thing you know i that's how i kind of graduated from engineering uh kind of uh, having my own ideas mm. uh, so i sometimes i believe that probably i was lucky that i wasn't in that race um you know uh first time i'm sharing this one by the way mm-hmm. that i never appeared in any of my campus interviews the twist is that i never appeared in um, the campus interviews and you know there are some public service examinations after that what to do i forgot mm-hmm. the names of those examinations um i even didn't appear for those and uh, at that time there was a lot of trend of civil services and uh, ias and those kind of exams as well so i kind of bypassed all those all entire track uh so was it was it because guess. um is it because you were not interested in engineering before getting into engineering i'm assuming that you got into engineering in 1991 um yeah so you yeah. were not interested in engineering then how did you end up in i was in engin- uh, i was very much interested in engineering so my story basically goes back to a little bit to even my in my schooling time so in eighth grade i was having this crazy idea 
that I wanted to be a, a scientist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I then I figured out that how, what was my best way to become a scientist. I, I loved learning. So I l learned everything which came across, uh, you know, around me. But the engineering was my best bet to get into uh, being a scientist. So mm -hmm. that was the kind of track I had taken. That, you know, I want to go for engineering. Um, I went on for engineering. I graduated as a kind of decent, uh, I would say, graduate. Um, but the thing is that probably the engineering job, the way the people know at that time, that wasn't something I was prepared to do. Mm. So when I passed out engineering, I actually went on uh, to a very small training center at a $50 job. And I think I served there for some time while I was waiting for the right things to really happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, there are passions inside you that gives you some guidance or clarity that what direction you should move. Um, the, I think the, the problem happens is when we don't recognize those things, what's going on into our head, and we get into the race what other people are following. So I think I deliberately somehow was taken out from that race. I went on to join this training center, spent some time there, and uh, then within about a short time of about one year, I, I would say, I got hired as a scientist uh -huh. in one of the premier research lab in India called CSIR. Right. So, so uh, which which lab of CSIR uh, were you employed in, sir? It's called the CSIO. It's a Center ah, Scientific Instrument. Sector Thirty, Chandigarh, right? Because that's yeah, where. That's right. <laughs> so I never knew about this, and <laughs> I did my internship in CSIO. In, uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, the college internship that we have to do, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> wow. So that's that's another thing uh, that that we get to know now. So so that's amazing. So you got you got into uh, you know research at that level. How did you end up in corporate training? Okay. So now that that's in fact a fantastic question, and uh, that's where the lot of things has happened in my life. I joined as this uh, scientist, this organization because I wanted to be a scientist. That was somewhere deep in my mind. And, but at the same time, I love learning. So for me, learning has no boundaries. I mean, I, I learned physics, chemistry, psychology, even palmistry. So when it comes to learning, I was kind of open. But there was no boundaries for me. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that kind of came in my conversation, the way I interact with people. And I love teaching them and sharing with them, okay, this is not the way possibly you should use this way. So I think those things were naturally somewhere embedded in my personality. So five years into that job of scientist, uh, what happened is uh, there was a vocational training institution which was part of that organization uh, established with the help of Switzerland government. And I was moved into that department mm -hmm. to take care of training. Mm -hmm. I mean, at surface it kind of looked like a punishment uh, <laughs> position, you can say, because, uh, you know, who, there won't be any scientists who would want to go into training. But I was up for those kind of challenges. And that changed my life, really. It cemented my passion for learning, and it basically came entirely into limelight. So I, I spent about a decade in that organization. So when I quit that organization, that just Swiss brand was with me. That mm. name tag gave me a lots of opportunities, getting associated with the learning bodies or stretching from Switzerland to Ireland. So that was my shot at it. Mm. And then subsequently, I kind of moved into different countries and positions. But somehow, whichever role I went into, they saw that I had this flair for learning. Probably I was a manufacturer for leading the learning roles. And that's how, you know, my journey kind of get, got me into a position where I now manage uh, um, Hall of the Fame Training Organization, mm -hmm. which is also ranked uh, one among top five in the world wow. for a $30 billion U.S. corporation. So that's how, you know, kind of, uh, I kind of moved from an engineer then to be a scientist and finally to be a learning leader in, in a proper space. Wow, that's that's amazing, sir. In fact, just to give some information about, uh, you know, certain organizations that you talked about to our viewers. 
essential scientific industrial research organizations. There are about 62, 63 labs all across the country under this particular uh, organization. And the one that we talked about is CSIO, Central Scientific Indust uh, Instruments Organization uh, in, in Chandigarh. And within that campus, there is this, uh, I think it's one of the most famous industrial training institutes in the country. It's, it's uh, alumni are placed all over the world actually. And very few people know about it. It's called the Indo-Swiss ITI. And uh, yeah. you'd be surprised to know, sir, that I am in the future, in the near future, I'm I'm, I'm actually doing an episode on Indo-Swiss, uh, something related That's, to that. So that is okay. such an amazing, uh, you know, insight. And you know, what's uh, more amazing is the fact that not a lot of people know about CSIR labs. Yeah. And I think even those who know, probably very few know that somebody can start from CSIO in Chandigarh and end up at a position that you are at. So that's an amazing journey. It must be very yeah. adventurous for you. It was, it was. And uh, I think that most of the credit of my journey, the way it kind of panned out finally, uh, it is, I think, lesser of a CSIO and more of an Indo-Swiss mm. because that's where the, it gave me an international flair mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of my experience. And uh, lots of doors got opened up. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the scientist profile is concerned and CSIO name, uh, that was there, but people possibly knew Indo Swiss more than anything else. So that was my my you know opportunity. Wow, you must have seen such a dramatic shift between the Indian technical infrastructure coming from an REC, uh, Regional Engineering College, uh, now NITs, uh, and then working at a national level uh, scientific industrial uh, research lab, and then completely moving out of India into this international scientific infrastructure. What is it like, sir? What is the difference between the Indian scientific infrastructure and the international scientific infrastructure? Oh, that's a very big question. And uh, I think I'm going to take a moment to really think about uh, there was times when uh, when I moved out of India and I kind of, you know, almost shocked uh, the way the things were being done in international space versus in India. So what I realized is that most of the technologies at that point of time, not now, mm -hmm. now I think there have been a lot of transformation. There have been great leaders of CSIR as well as some of the scientific uh, ministries. They are doing great job in transforming, but I'm talking about 20 years ago, roughly 15 years ago, the kind of research we were involved versus the research that was being done at international level, they was totally different. So the, if I need to put it in words, it was something like this. Something which has already been developed at an international level that was being copied about five to ten years later and redeveloped in indigenous ways. And uh, though that was kind of labeled as that we manufactured in India or we created that technology in India, but it already existed somewhere. Mm -hmm. It came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a lag, lag in terms of the transformation that the how the technology basically flow from international level to India. Um, biggest piece is, I think, the information. Uh, if you see, that was in the internet times. There was no way for you to get connected with the scientists abroad. But when I moved out of uh, uh, India, the number one thing I realized, what I need to master was international project management. And once I kind of gotten an idea that, okay, you got a goal to achieve, and everything, all the resources, all the infrastructure, all the manpower, and everything that needs to be done toward that goal. And that was the whole difference in the way the technology development happened in India versus uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and um, also, you know, the kind of countries, it varied. I mean, I, yeah. I kind of looked at how they were doing in Switzerland versus in UK or in other lesser developed part of Europe as well as in the U.S. and Singapore. So there was a lot of different different ways they, these guys were doing the technology development, which uh, I think we were lacking behind at that time. So I'm going to put you uh, through a difficult question here because I really okay. want to know this. Um, okay. Our governments have been pushing this agenda of, you know, uh, more scientific research, more indigenous development of things. But uh, more or less, we have kind of failed in that, uh, you know, endeavor. Uh, and especially with the geopolitical situation right now with China and so many other things, there's, there's a greater push for all these things. But things are improving, as you said. They're, they're improving, but they're improving slowly. 
mostly uh, mostly the private sector is coming up with innovations uh, you know at, at a global level which is commendable uh, certain things made in india are not available elsewhere right now yeah but do you think uh, so the question basically is how long do you think will the government uh, the governments of india or the government infrastructure created uh, in india will will you know come at par with some level of global excellence we are right now at a very low level but what do you think how much time is going to take uh that's a good question and very difficult one as well so here is what i realized uh i was working on some of the product and some of the technologies when i was scientist mm-hmm. and uh, when i went uh, outside india what i realized is whatever i was working on whatever i was trying to create that has already been created 15 years ago by some of the organizations in norway and in sweden and uh, and there were a lot of things i was doing which potentially were already done in russia or other part of europe and uh, what i realized is that if we are already 15 years behind i was trying to kind of recreate what has already been created simply because we we possibly as a research organization we didn't have enough money to buy those technologies what we could do is we could buy the component they used possibly mm-hmm. and create something similar but of course not of that scale and uh, quality now that was my data pointer 15 years ago it mm-hmm. was a 15 years gap in terms of development processes mm-hmm. today because of internet and infrastructure we have access to international journals we can read latest and greatest article what has been done out there and there are a lot of flexibility in terms of importing the technology understanding how does it work mm-hmm. and uh, there are a lot of forums there are people there are no boundaries uh, when it comes to virtual conversation so i think that gap has gotten down but mm-hmm. i still believe it is uh, close to 5 years or to 10 years of gap between what has been done in other countries or in advanced uh, nations versus what's happening in india right now mm-hmm. so there's a there's another question that i would like to ask in this set of <laughs> questions before we move on to the next one because you've worked in the csir uh, you know ecosystem and you you kind of understand it what are some of the challenges that uh, you know the government of india needs to overcome to make csir at the same level of uh, even isro i mean make csir at the same level as isro because it's yep. just, just an international standard right now so All right yeah uh, so one of the thing about isro is they are very strong in two things uh, which is the foundational requirement to create any kind of technology number one they are great in systems engineering or oh, system engineering means they understand that how different pieces are going to be put together to make it work mm-hmm. the system they work are massive mm-hmm. so system engineering is the way when we are working on massive technologies because then it also allow you certain part you can outsource certain part you can do in house certain part you can import but you have a overall picture how everything is going to get integrated mm-hmm. to achieve the technology function you want mm-hmm. that's number one number two is project management that has been historically very very weak mm-hmm. scientists are typically very bad project managers <laughs> to be honest and particularly the international way of managing the projects and the complex large scale projects they have never been trained mm-hmm. they possibly are given certain two days three days kind of training but uh, do they get trained like a top notch world class project uh, leader possibly not and that's what i realize is these two things unless we give it to scientists there is not going to be possibility to bring to the international level how i realize these things is uh, after i moved out from india as i said the number one thing i realize is the way the projects are being managed in technology space mm-hmm. were different uh, the, the whole approach was different and the way the technology was being developed uh, was different and uh, then i i had the scientific mind what's different what is different okay and then i started comparing and figured out system engineering and project management these were the two things then i took a you know kind of on myself to get into this deeply into international project management 
And eventually, after through several uh, steps, milestones, I acquired a certification certified project director, which is the highest certification in project management. Mm -hmm. And I am also the certified system engineering manager. So with those uh, things, I kind of understood that the way the things needs to happen to accelerate technology adoption or even innovation in India, these are possibly these two keys. And we don't train our scientists in these two areas most wow. of the times. That's that's such a uh, such a big statement that you're making. That probably one of the reasons why we are five years or maybe even ten years behind the rest of the world in uh, research and scientific research is prob is not what most people think. When most people I know they think it's because of brain drain. It's not because of brain drain. It's just because of lack of management uh, techniques and knowledge. And it's that right. is <laughs> very sad to know, but it's a big statement, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, Moving on to the next one, sir. So, especially, uh, you know, we are living in this COVID world right now. And uh, this has this, I think everyone will realize this now, that technology always disrupts a lot of uh, corporate learning, a lot of corporate training, right? And especially in COVID-19, we've seen that technology, uh, you know, or corporate learning has been disrupted crazily so it's a two-part question sir first is uh, generally speaking how does and how much does technology disrupt corporate training scenarios and secondly how has covid contributed to all of that okay that's a pretty large question there are a lot of different aspects to this uh, this question um, so I'm going to kind of uh, give you an answer in a little bit of segments, okay? Um, technology is always, always the backbone of business, not only the corporate training, but uh, mainly for the business. Sometimes it is too much, in fact, right? But the technology disruption is not new. Pandemic only accelerated it. Mm -hmm. But if you see the history, dot-com, tech uh, innovation, then we got social media, mm -hmm. then we got the technology like AR, VR kind of technology, so technology disruption, I would say, was always there. How we respond to it, that's the important piece. The executives in most of the organization, they do want to ride upon the technology waves, either because they genuinely see an unfulfilled need in the market, mm -hmm. or they simply want to look cool because their competitors are doing it. So these are the two drive business driver, I would say, for the technology disruption. So. What I believe is that these two tendencies create two kind of technology disruption uh, in corporate training. First ones are need driven. Mm -hmm. There is a need in the market. Uh, for example, uh, AR technology and HoloLens. Um, it has changed the corporate technical training by strong. Mm -hmm. Because the biggest issue in technical training is that these are very time intensive, very money intensive. So the path to proficiency is very long. So that's where these technologies give us a way to provide a self-guided, immersive environment to new employees, where they can learn almost the way they learn in a traditional training. It will allow them to pull up the resources like videos, documents in real time. And they will be able to do almost the same thing what they would uh, learn otherwise. So now what we're saying is that, you know, um, with all these resources given through these uh, augment reality, they possibly don't need anybody. Uh, they don't need to ask any questions. These technologies allow them to basically diffuse a barrier that work is learning and learning is work now. So those boundaries are kind of diffusing. People now learn while working and working itself is a learning, mm -hmm. those sort of thing. So, you know, when once we eliminate that gap of training versus performance, the skill acquisition and proficiency get accelerated. It speed up. So on top of that, that technology gives you a way to monitor their efficiency, proficiency, and productivity real time. Manager mm -hmm. can check what tasks they are doing correctly and what what where they are failing. So they can provide instant help. So now the technology disruption are mostly driven by the customer demand. You know, mm -hmm. market need. Customer want more. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other things like. Uh, Corporates would want to, you know, reduce money on travel. Their budget sometimes get limited. So these are the restrictions that will basically allow um, 
the training to, to transform because of technology. Okay, so that's that's what the first factor is. What I said is it is driven by a need, not by the desire for someone to look cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another example, uh, possibly I see, is need-driven technology is a remote training that you have seen. Uh, something we are doing right now, kind of. So a lot of companies started offering those products, uh, which allowed a lot of things. For example, you can convert your laptop as a virtual studio. You can convert your DSLR cameras into webcam, uh, streaming services, and a lot of those things, uh, you know, these days. Now, um, even the large-scale conference, you know, those got, uh, those got stopped. And then now one company came up with uh, some solutions, uh, like uh, they do a holographic uh, projection of the speaker on world stages. So the speaker doesn't yeah. even have to, you know, uh, kind of travel. So it's, it's a professional development these companies are providing a lot of different experiences offering to the to the customer and to the audience. So now that this is one thing, this is where they are trying to create a lot of uh, need-driven technological innovations. But then there are on the other side also. There are certain innovations or disruption where people are just adopting it without mm -hmm. thinking much, just to look cool. And uh, that's a problem. Um, I, I just came across one, uh, uh, one conference. What these guys are doing is they are doing the entire conference using VR headsets. <laughs> So they are giving VR headset to the audience and to the speaker. When the question comes is, what's the real need? I mean, mm -hmm. do people don't learn by virtual other mechanism? What's really the need for a virtual headset? So I think they kind of kind of over glamorizing by bringing in technology. Sometimes they just yeah. want to look cool. So those are the two disruption. What I would say is going on in the market. Mm -hmm. But uh, the most important piece is that if you're going to apply technology, uh, technology needs to be driven by the needs. You have to ask a bigger question mm -hmm. that is it even needed? Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, technology needs to come in context of learning design. If learning design requires uh, a technology because it will accelerate learning of the people, yeah, it's the right choice, but otherwise not. So in market today, the corporate training, the way we look at it, technologies are impacting the training differently, but it depends upon whether it is need driven or it's just an attempt to make it glamorous. Wow, that's that's an amazing statement, sir, because that is so true. Um, in fact, do you feel that sometimes, um, like we've all seen these big smartphone makers, Samsung and, uh, you know, so many others, LG, uh, they keep on pushing new models almost every two months or every quarter. And mm -hmm. it's not only one new model, like companies like Samsung, they have different segments of smartphones, like from the yeah. cheapest to the, you know, most premium. And they keep on rolling out models for all of these segments. Yep. Do you think they do that uh, to drive the business? Uh, because clearly there is no need. I mean, a phone lasts at least three, four years easily. There is yep. no need for a new phone, but then they keep doing it for what? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good marketing question, uh, really. Uh, so I'm in a semiconductor space. So uh, I work here with uh, you know, the customers, so those who fabricate chips, and uh, there are a lot of things that basically drive this market. And uh, one of the major driver for uh, mobile phone manufacturer particularly is that they want to cater to different needs. Now, there are a range of customers, those who can who would want to afford a lower-end phone versus a higher-end phone. So now, they have the same, te the technology is exactly the same. Technology is exactly the same. What they do is they basically play around with features. And different market segments may be quite different features. You might have a need for a uh, high-end camera, but your need may not be writing on the screen. So they keep uh, basically playing around with the combinations of features available on a given technology. Mm -hmm. But if fundamentally, if we see, there are only two, three different kind of display technologies. There are two, three different kind of processing technologies. Yeah. So they build their technologies and now they play with what customer really want. And different customer want different things. That's where they come up with the different flavors of their product. Um, 
is it a deliberate uh, strategy probably yes because not everyone is going to buy note 10 mm. there are there's a range of customer who are going to buy a3 a4 uh, or other models for the for the phones so i think it is basically catering to different countries and uh, also we should remember that economically different countries stand differently now what we can afford in singapore or in the us possibly the countries uh, and some of the asian countries may not even be able to afford that higher end mm -hmm. so imagine the price of these note 10 how much that price is now in india so i think uh, they are trying to cater to different segment and that's how they are selling it wow i i also see another aspect over here which is like uh, you know complete corporate rivalry because there's a very big case study here where samsung basically killed htc <laughs> <laughs> and well those things do have and probably we can have another discussion about those things um yeah. sir how has covid accelerated uh, the technology related disruptions in corporate training um okay that's a good question and in fact it is very contemporary because things are happening right now hmm. um i think the biggest thing what what has happened with the covid 19 is that uh, the people who were in a very traditional training they got a big hit immediately mm -hmm. i give you one our, our example i manage a very large training center and it's pretty traditional in the sense that these are very complex training on the products and people will have to travel down to the training center to get the training as a multi week training mm -hmm. five weeks six weeks or eight weeks kind of training mm -hmm. a pretty intense now what happened is the moment covid 19 hap uh, occurred none of these guys could travel so all of a sudden we needed to find out how we can do it differently and within about 3 to 4 weeks of time we figured out different technologies that could support uh, teaching the same thing what we used to like a live streaming uh, it could be ar or videos uh, so all those things basically came in play and we were able to deliver training remotely without having these people travel Uh, down to our training centers so this is one example how the the transformation covid has actually driven transformation into training and learning space most of the training corporate training companies they are getting into this uh, um, virtual space trying to embed a lot of different technologies but uh, there is a little there is challenge also not everyone's experiments are really successful Mm -hmm. covid is driving the changes um but if they don't if they are not faithful to the learning design if they don't really take care of how the learners are going to learn if they are just kind of incorporating for the sake of delivering it it's not going to pan out nicely um i got another example um before covid 19 came in i signed up for pretty expensive training program mm -hmm. and it was face to face training program and fantastic outstanding and uh, during covid-19 uh, uh, it wasn't really possible so these guys changed that training program into uh, online version virtual training now imagine they are offering a tower non-stop training on a given day all they are basically doing is the guy is talking on the other side of the camera they try to use some of the breakout room they try to ask more question trying to engage but imagine the foundationally what your session cannot be 8 hours yeah so so they they, they implemented the covid-19 allowed them to transform the training but it's a very poor quality training very painful training so there are company those who are doing mix and match of lot of things but problem what i see is those who stay true to the instruction design how learning happen in people how to engage people in the learning process versus just making a change for the sake because you don't have any other option these are the two right now the two different ways how companies are working on addressing this challenge but covid-19 no doubt really has accelerated the technology adoption Mm. which nobody ever thought of before and now they are putting up the streaming they're putting up the virtual virtual training a lot of different gadgets are being involved now to make that happen mm -hmm. and uh, also work from home kind of things this is basically a transformation corporates never ever thought that people could work from home 
or even receive training at home. So COVID-19 has accelerated and because there is no other option at this point of time. But that option existed all the time yeah. right, with the organizations. As I said, um, when an, an executive can drive the transformation, technology transformation, either because there is a need or there is a tendency to look good. Mm. They, they all always had this choice. Only thing that choice got no other option now. They need to accelerate it. Uh, very well explained, sir. In fact, I remember my days in uh, 2011 when I was working for this American IT company uh, after college. And, you know, uh, we used to use Cisco WebEx quite a lot. So, because uh, plainly, I mean, I, I was in Noida with a team working in Noida and uh, the rest of the team was in the Midwest in the US somewhere. And it, it is just, you know, cheaper to do this. So there was definitely the need to use Cisco WebEx. But on the other hand, they also realized that, um, you know, just just doing this transactional kind of training doesn't solve things. So we would have these, you know, uh, meetups where, um, you know, people from India would go to the US or people from the US would come to India and there would be, you know, these informal casual things or casual meetings. With the virtual training, sir, and I'm not saying that they are not, you know, well, as you rightly said, they are slightly less effective right now, but uh, they can definitely become more effective with the use of technology. But there's an entire aspect of human to human connection, which is just missing. I mean, I'm looking at a screen right now. I'm not really seeing yeah. you in front of me. There's yeah. definitely something missing over there. What do you think uh, about that? Do you think that's, that's going to be a problem? Yeah, there is a problem. Uh, in fact, it is a big problem. Um, because the way we look at this, um, today, if uh, somebody needs, for example, a few years ago, um, executives needed the training on decision making, complex decision making. And that's where they would uh, teach them how to do a great data mining. How do you look at the trends? How do you look at the stats? Mm -hmm. How do you look at uh, you know drawing the intelligence out of that dead data? And then they, they basically will create their arguments or conclusions out of that one that how they would make the decision. Now, the whole aspect of that the, the things I just explained right now can be done by machines mm. the AI powered machines and which automatically kind of look at the data can mine the data can even create the whole decision making model for you mm. and even mm. give you the abstract decision that okay this is going to work this is not going to work based on this this the sea of data now if machine can do that then what human is going to do Machine cannot do what human can do, which is emotion, which mm. is connection, mm. and which is a psychology. Machine wouldn't have the gut feeling. Lots of decisions we make in corporate based on our intuition. And sometimes intuitions override the data decisions. So these are the things that need to be taught in training. Mm -hmm. Even if the virtual, it's a virtual training, but how are you going to teach that one, that kind of thing virtually? That's a big problem because people learn because of emotional loading. Emotions bind our learning in our brain. So that's very important that the, when we are looking at the screen, if we don't get the emotional loading, if we don't get the emotional connection, if we don't get the emotional involved in learning, learning may not even stick for a long while. What screen can be used is for sharing the information, mm. sharing the knowledge. But sharing information, sharing knowledge does not necessarily lead to creating the skills you need. Right. Ultimately, well, you're going to need skills at your workplace. Wow. That's so nicely explained, sir. Uh, just, you know, but this, uh, the, the, the episode before yours, uh, episode 23, I was talking to uh, the senior managing director of a fellowship in Japan. I was part of that fellowship last year. And the same thing happened over there. So this year's cohort... They were all supposed to land in Japan and, you know, start their training process, but they had to take it, uh, you know, online. And what she was saying was, we did not expect that uh, the response would be so good, but all of them, all the new cohort, uh, you know, fellows, they are all distributed across the world. One is in US, one is in Russia and so on and so forth. They have kind of adapted. They are making those connections they have kind of understood and accepted the fact that this is the future way. Now, that is great. That is great. Humans adapt, right? But 
I have a fear over here that they will never truly experience the same kind of learning that I experienced last year because I went there. So that, that part of emotional loading will not be there. That's right. That's right. And That's... do you think that this will change the expectations of learners in the future as well? That, okay, that is not going to happen. We, are, we have to stick with this. And will that impact their work somehow? Yeah. Uh, I, I seriously believe that we have come a long way from an academic kind of training. Remember mm-hmm. the the many years ago, about 20 years, 30 years ago, when these guys came out with the academic training. Academic training is basically a, a, a person standing on the podium and delivering and downloading the knowledge. Okay, And uh, what corporations did is, they didn't have any better model. So they took these academic model, lecture style uh, models, and they brought into the corporate training. And most of the corporate training, if you see about 20 years ago or 10 years ago, even today, by the way, um, many companies tend to do these lecture kind of training. Yeah. They will bring some 20 people, 30 people into the one room. Somebody will talk about certain things on the slides and they will keep downloading information and all that. And training is done when this guy's slides are over. So that's academic style. Today it also happens, but now corporates have learned a lot of things that we need to have a lot more engagement. We need to have a lot more experiential learning. But all those things, having said that, um, what I, I'm saying is we have already came a long way from that one directional learning to a multi-sensory learning. Yeah. Multi-sensory learning where, where your eyes are in, involved, your ears are uh, involved, you're sensing the thing, you're feeling the things. So it's, you need all the senses to learn something and encode that information in your brain, to use it in your job or in your life. Now, if we're going to go back to, again, screen-based learning, that component of social learning, informal learning, the way the learning happens through interaction, through emotions, through thinking, that may not really come across strongly. So I think that's going to be a problem. There are uh, uh, certain areas, there are certain skills which can only be acquired by getting participating into the experience, Mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. But then what's going to happen is, if uh, these things continue, then we will be back to the square one, delivering knowledge, information, content to people. And it will be more of a downloading process rather than a processing process. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's uh, it, right? And that's, that's the thing with technology, I guess. Um, whenever there is a new technology and we are forced to use it, we all worry about the same things. How are we going to do things now? But then we yeah. become okay with it. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. We need to become part of life. Yeah. All right, sir. Uh, moving on to the next one. So every year, every year, you know, skills are becoming obsolete. So if technology is changing so fast, obviously the skills are going to become obsolete. How do you cope up with this, you know, constant change? Because the human mind is probably not as fast or not as capable, not everyone's mind is at the same level, to absorb new technology, to absorb uh, new learnings. How do we cope up with that? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to need to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a very contemporary question. This is our current challenge, really. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a study, in that study it was found that uh, workforce itself is not a differentiator for organizations because more or less all organizations have access to the same talent pool they hire from same set of universities they go to the same market to hire people so they get the same level of qualified talent and they have similar level of skills Mm -hmm. what differentiates organizations from you know one organization to another one is how fast workforce can master newer skills and can become good in newer technology, I mean, newer process, or maybe newer disruption that has just came in. That's how these guys can basically stay ahead. And that's a differentiator. All right. So I think um, that, that this, is, this is very, very important because world is moving so fast now. It's really kind of changing 
And it's very important for organizations and employees to be able to learn these new technologies and be able to adopt new skills in a shorter amount of time. And that's where, uh, you know, the thing uh, about time to proficiency comes in picture. Time to proficiency metrics uh, historically has never been into business uh, discussions. Mm. But lately, lots of organizations are now paying attention that uh, how should we focus on measuring whether how fast our employees are coming up to speed on newer innovations or newer processes and how we can monitor it. And once we monitor it, how do we make sure that we compress it or make it shorter? Or how do we accelerate that part to proficiency mm. of our employees? So that's uh, the very important part that's going on because there is, a, there is something going on with the skills. In 2017, uh, Deolips, uh, they did a study. They found that an engineer, software engineer, needs to learn totally new set of skills every four and a half years. So imagine that four years you spend on learning a skill, by the time you're out of your university, it's no longer needed. Mm. So now what they are saying is the half-life, half-life of any new skill is about one and a half year. Ah, so or, it's decreased. Right? So yeah. it has kind of decreased in the sense that every year you're mm. gonna need to uh, master a new technology, a new set of skill, and that's the only way you can actually perform in the job. Mm. So this is a chase. This is a never-ending chase. Because what happens is it takes time to master a technology. It takes time to master a new product or a new process. It takes uh, time to master the concept uh, that how we're going to use this all about in our business. By the time you master it, uh, probably you haven't even mastered it. New technology is already knocking your door. Mm. So it's, it's a constant chase. This is a never-ending chase. Organizations are trying their best, but uh, the chances are that they always get into this loop. Mm. The main reason is that they depend a lot more on traditional training. Mm. And training is not a solution when we talk about speed. We're going to need to think differently, our philosophy, the focus, uh, the, the way we use the infrastructure and ecosystem, that needs to come in together differently in order to cope up with this speed. Oh, so definitely that's the need. I mean, new learning systems, uh, they will come into place because now we are facing COVID situation. But sir, what about the people? So we've been, uh, you know, I've, I've created another education forum with a bunch of other educators and we keep on having these discussions about education. Um, we once invited a professor from the US. Uh, she She's a, you know, a tenured professor in City University, New York. And she was telling us how... Because certain older professors did not know how to use Zoom or were not willing enough to use, you know, computers and start training online, they were clearly told that you will be fired if you don't do so. Mm -hmm. And every organization, whether it's in the academia or in governments or in, in the private sector, every organization will have these older employees who are not supposed to be tech savvy because their expertise comes from somewhere else. Yeah. How are they going to cope up? What is, is there a solution which, which is there or does every older employee or every older expert need a younger apprentice or assistant to manage the technology for them? Uh, not really, not really. I think uh, um, it's, it's a much larger problem. In fact, I, I did my two doctors trying to solve this puzzle and this puzzle is really more complex than what we really think. Um, most of the organization depend upon training, but training, as I said, is not the solution. That's what I found in my research. So there are two aspects to this one. One is organization mm. or a business as a whole. The second part is the professional as individuals like you and me. So now these are the two different parts of the same problem. How organization as a whole is going to accelerate the proficiency of employees and how the individuals are going to take care of their own learning as well. Mm. So these are the two parts. Wait, let's, let's segment into two parts and then we'll talk about this one, right? So for organization, it means their team needs to constantly learn new things. They need training. They need resources to do it. Um, for example, I, I give you one example. 
that uh, managers a uh, few years ago, uh, they were only required to manage their team face to face. And then it evolved into something else. The globalization came. And now they found their people sitting in a country they have never landed their foot on. And uh, they thought they, they would be able to manage uh, by understanding, you know, they, okay, these guys are sitting in a different con- uh, culture. But they, contextually, the way their work style was different. So the manager continuously need to evolve and learn as a team. So this is an organization challenge. How they bring the proficiency of the manager to a level where they are proficient in shorter amount of time. And now with COVID-19 kind of pandemic, you see what has happened is now managers need to master other things. All of these guys were sitting in different countries. Now they're sitting in their homes in a very distractful environment. How as a manager, they're going to coach these people to keep their productivity up while taking care of the rest of the problem. So it's a bigger challenge. So managers who are going to be successful, those who become, you know, come up to speed faster. So now this is an organization challenge. How the organization is really going to uh, handle this one is using the ecosystem. The ecosystem is within which uh, the job happens. In an organization, we have uh, peers, we have mentors, we have uh, coaches, we have experts who have done that kind of work before. There are performance support systems, there are tools, there are mechanisms, there are leaders, there are ma- managers to the managers. So there's a whole accountability system in organization. When we put all those things in play, that's where collectively everyone in the team, they start stepping up in terms of their proficiency. But when the moment we leave somebody, you figure it out, mm. that's where the people feel unsupported. They feel that, no, it's only my trouble or my challenge. Mm -hmm. So as as an individual, I have to either go with the management that, okay, I will try my best to learn or I take a stand, no, I can't learn. Mm -hmm. So so that at individual level, sometimes we do see that kind of resistance. But for corporation, what they need to do is, instead of spending huge amount of money on training, to try to teach these people the skills they need. What they need to do is they need to invest more on ecosystem that mm-hmm. surround these people so that they have a supportive environment. They have the performance support system that can help them. Uh, it, it can be as simple as that. For example, today, the moment the Zoom um, the infrastructure came in because people needed to use it, and many companies, what they did is they sent their employees to one day, two day, three day kind of Zoom training. They hired consultant to come and deliver training. Of, of course, most of those things happen virtually. Mm-hmm. I think that's a mistake. Mm-hmm. Mistake is because there are two kind of skills. One skills are what I call as input focus skills. Input focus skills are a lot of uh, to do a job. You need a lot of inputs. Inputs mean you got to know, know learning management system. You need to know this tracking system. You need to know how to use Zoom as a tool. It's after all a tool, correct? And then you need to know how do you do the automated assessment of your student and all sort of things. All those systems, all those uh, processes, all those infrastructure things are what we call as input skills, Mm -hmm. okay? Training, keep focusing on input skills. But if you talk about that professor, what's his output skill his output skill is what gives him the output of the job his his job is to teach students that's the output skill so as a professor his core skill is ability to teach Mm. not ability to use zoom Mm. so this is where the organization get it wrong because if you see has anything changed on output skill no because teaching is still teaching Mm. That's a foundational skill. It's a very stable skill. It doesn't change over time too much. Mm. And but that's our primary responsibility as a you know as a professor or an employee. But input skills, which are related to our infrastructure, which are related to our technology, which are related to new processes, which are related to new things we're gonna do, those are dynamic. This is where the technology disruption happened. So using Zoom 
is an input skill driven by technology change. Ability to teach student is an output focused skill which doesn't change much. So as organization, if we say that you're gonna stick to your core and we're gonna provide you self-learning or on the spot performance support system, which will guide you as you do the job, mm -hmm. rather than sending them for three days, four days painful training. So I think the organization need to divide these skills. What's your primary skill, which is related to the output you're gonna give us mm -hmm. as part of the job? And what's the skills that's gonna go input? Now, input skills are where we need speed. Right. And But again, input focused skills are the one which can be done differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can put a system in place which can take care of this. I can hire an intern. Mm -hmm. I can outsource it. I can uh, delegate it to an employee who is better equipped with that kind of skills. Mm -hmm. Whereas I focus on my output focus skill. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of divide that needs to be considered when we talk about what we really gonna put our employees into. Right. That's that's very well put, sir. In fact, this reminds me of of you know um, a few years back uh, I saw this uh, TED talk, fresh TED talk at that time. Um, and in that they were discussing about, you know, massive online, uh, learning courses, MOOCs, right? So they said instead of MOOCs, which are basically, you know, looking at the screen and well, not very effective, uh, they need to have, uh, MAITs, uh, massive adaptive and interactive courses, mm -hmm. okay. adaptive in the sense it, be, it should be based on the learner's ability to learn at that particular yeah. moment. It should right. adapt accordingly. So, okay, if you're stuck somewhere, you automatically keep on focusing on the same thing which you're stuck on before yeah. moving on to the next, you know, topic or module or whatever. Second okay. thing was interactive because yeah. just learning from the machine is just, you know, doesn't give you the emotional loading that you said. Right. Do you think uh, the learner management systems or, you know, the L&D departments of uh, various organizations, they are focusing on making their, you know, uh, learning modules more adaptive and more interactive using technology? Uh, there is a concept of this one. There is a new LMS that allows to bypass certain requirements depending upon the capability level of the learner. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, most of the time, these capabilities are used to line up web-based training, video-based training. Um, whereas the application of that uh, system is in a total canvas of the job. Mm -hmm. Because certain things I'm going to do on the job, certain things I'm going to read, certain things I'm going to watch, certain things I'm going to get experience by doing it myself. So now if you put that adaptive system in regards to which ask. A learner to provide the evidence mm. that uh, what he has done, mm. uh, whether he has accomplished certain milestone, if we create the milestones correctly, and uh, that would mean that there is a assess assessment mechanism that will allow system to know where this learner is and then change the learning path accordingly. So there's a lot of research on this uh, adaptive learning path, which allows the fast learner to finish the same set of requirements in a shorter time, whereas the slow learner is going to take longer time. So that way they, they can track it. But uh, sometimes the, the system don't really work the way they are intended. Because mm -hmm. how would you know that somebody has accomplished the milestone to the desired level of proficiency or not? Most of the organization, they tend to put a paper pen type of exam. Now, the thing is, when I'm going to do the job, my job is not something which can be evaluated with paper and pen, multiple choice questions. Mm. So this is where they get it wrong. And then the effectiveness of this adaptive system mm. do not work really very well. Mm. So the adaptability of people's, people's skill. When people work together, there's a lot of context involved in regards to capabilities. So the capability needs to be assessed by somebody. And then somebody would need to look at the context that, okay, here's the job and you are performing that job to a certain level. And I think you're not going to need A, B, C. You're going to need, you know, D, E, F, something like that. So that adaptability comes with the human interaction. So when we depend upon these adaptive systems uh, to control people's learning, that's where the learning itself fails. 
Right. Human connection, human involvement in learning is very important. Mm. Otherwise, we would never need teachers, yeah. ever. <laughs> Isn't it? We'll all learn from technology. But we know very well we don't learn from technology. Technology is just an enabler. The problem with technology is when we make the technology at the front gate of learning organization, just to claim that we are technology-based learning organization. <laughs> Why? But that doesn't work. Mm. Technology is a tool. Mm. Correct. I mean, it, technology is just a help. But the learning happens as a human. From human to human, social interaction, involvement, experiencing, observing. So those parts still need to be there in learning domain. Even if we want to make it adaptive, mm -hmm. it has to be adaptive in the social sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very valid point, sir. So, sir, because of the COVID-19 world, so many things are changing and they're changing quite rapidly. Right. Okay. Where do you see the world going after covid Will there be, you know, a ratio of that, okay, if it's a learning module, 70% of will be online or tech enabled and 30% will be in person uh, based on maybe, I mean, I don't personally believe that the social distancing thing is going to last more than one and a half years, but that's a different thing to be seen. But where do you see the world going from here after COVID? What is the future of learning uh, in the world? Okay, uh, there, there are two parts to this question, in mm -hmm. fact. And it's going to be almost kind of contradictory. The first part is how the organization take this uh, these changes. Okay, um, for organization, they have already seen huge money saving. Mm. They they already saw that employees could work from home. They already saw that we could give online module to employees and remote training. They already saw that the trainers don't need to travel. They already saw that the learners don't need to travel. So they are already making millions of dollars of saving because mm. of this. Mm. On one side, it, it's a crisis, but that crisis has given a huge business benefit to organization. Organization are not going to let go that money easily. Yes. Right? So so the, the trend, what I see uh, talking to different people is organization is going to keep pressing for the a large ratio of online or remote learning. Because they, they already saw the money. Now, what's going to happen is they, they're going to continue and force that kind of ratio. And uh, the world, the learning world we're going to see will follow that. Because ultimately, it's all investment, right? If executives are not funding the money required to run the operation, it's going to scale down. So scaling, the scaling up is going to happen in terms of online. Mm. Scaling down in terms of face-to-face -face or any training that's going to need uh, travel. Mm. So there is a good possibility that the world is going to see a different ratio, mm. probably 60% online and 40% experiential or social. Okay. Now that that's one part. Another part of this one is also um, in the speaking industry, organization are saving huge amount of money because now they don't have to get the um, speakers travel. They can mm. deliver remotely. Now, this money-saving model is always the core because it lines up with the bottom line of the organization. <laughs> so that's number one. Now, whether or not learning is effective, that's going to take a back seat. Uh, there was a research that most of the e-learning uh, popularity mm. is because of the time-saving organization get rather than the quality cool. of learning what the learner gets. Mm. Okay? Mm. So that's one part. Now, on the learner side, Learner side, nothing has changed. Learners are still human. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, the human mind is not going to change just because of technology adoption. In fact, many times technology can be a hindrance to learning if it is not used correctly. It mm -hmm. can be a lot more distraction. How mm -hmm. many people are today learning from Zoom? Mm -hmm. How many people can learn from uh, videos? Mm -hmm. If people can learn from videos, every one of them. There are billions of videos in YouTube, yeah. but pe people haven't gotten educated. All we can get learning from Zoom or from uh, videos is a content-based learning, a new insight, a knowledge, but it may not give me the skills to mm. do something hands-on where uh, my emotional uh, aspect is going to need to be involved, mm. where my hands-on aspect is going to be involved. 
So on the learner side, it's much more painful. In fact, learner would want the way it was with, this, of course, supplementary videos with supplementary online training. That's okay. Uh, I give you one example. I, I was talking about uh, a very expensive program I joined. So as a learner, I wanted hands-on. I wanted in-person. I wanted social experience. And everyone who mm. joined that batch, every one of them want that. Want the same thing. And they, yeah. And now they are saying it. They don't want online because if online is not designed correctly, it yeah. is going to be painful. Yeah. And most of the organizations, they don't even know how to design online learning effectively. Even if they do it, it's not the replica of physical experience. So I think learners will be forced into learning online or having a larger ratio of a remote learning. Mm. Will it work? Probably not. Will it shorten the time? It will shorten the time of in-person training, which is again going to translate to huge amount of money saving for organization. Mm. And that's where they're going to keep pushing it forward for mm. that kind of training. So the way I see the world after COVID, possibly we're going to see larger ratio, which is going to be unpleasant, mm. but it's going to save a lot of money for the organization. So depend upon which lens you want to see it from. But then, so I completely uh, understand that and uh, organizations which work on the bottom line, people whose promotions are linked to the bottom line and not the organizational view or vision, it's going to happen. But then also it creates opportunity. Like I come from the test prep industry. So test prep industry, basically what the test prep industry does is they provide services which the regular schools, organizations, uh, governments, universities don't provide. But the people need those services and they are willing to pay for it. Yeah, agree. Similarly, when there's an organizational training happening, which is 60% online and nobody wants to do it and it's only 40%, but to probably, you know, show up and show everyone that you're learning, you'll probably attend the training. You will learn lesser, but the organization will expect you to perform as if you have learned 100%. And then yeah. on top of that, the organization is not going to change because of the bottom line. So those learners, they are going to go somewhere else to learn. Do you think those yeah. opportunities are going to crop up more? There are lots of opportunities. In fact, I mean, every time there are changes, there are opportunities as well. Mm. Uh, for example, in training and uh, speaking business, there are a lot more requests coming for virtual training. Mm. But those are okay because uh, if you see the speaking business is all about uh, uh, being able to give the insights to people, which does not involve hands-on. It does mm. not involve a whole lot of experience. So it's, it's doable. Mm. Now, there are opportunities. People are going to get engaged and they're going to get work for because of this uh, whole uh, thing because they don't have to travel mm. and uh, possibly they can participate. A lot of people are going to deliver training, which they originally thought the barrier was very high uh, if it was face-to-face -face training. So those opportunities are going to come in. Plus, there are technologies which are going to make a, a learning accelerator because now you got an additional resource mm -hmm. to leverage mm -hmm. and it potentially can solidify your learning. So the way I take this, uh, this part is, so one part is the learning and another is that what the impact on the job in regards to opportunity. On the learning, more channel of learning you open up, mm. better the learning and more accelerated it is. But when you replace one channel completely with another channel, you're basically taking away something, mm. not adding mm. anything. Mm. So you gotta need to add technology as an add-on additional channel, not a replacement of another channel, which is more preferred for learning. That's number one. But second thing is on the job side, there, there are lots of lots of different opportunities that can happen um, in, in regards to there are lot new technologies which even allow you to remotely repair the equipment. Mm. So now you see the, the experts whose knowledge was untapped earlier can be tapped into that flow. So there are opportunities there where it's going to be a sort of a crowd expertise, what I call. Mm -hmm. Crowd ex expertise is where you draw from people, different people's mind to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something like uh, <clears throat> if today you got a social problem or you got a business problem, now you have ability to bring 20 masterminds from different parts of the world who have taught
top notch experience which you earlier couldn't afford because they mm-hmm. they are not accessible now you bring them into a forum one hour talk about the problem get the insight get the recommendation and you're done you you can get that crowd expertise to solve technical non technical managerial business problem that's the opportunity which is i think going to evolve into a different set of consulting services training services or expertise based services as well absolutely that that is such a nice uh, you know statement because i completely believe in it in fact uh, there is a concept called novatic science which is the you know the the knowledge of the collective all right or in uh, yeah. if, if people watch star trek then it is the borg which is the villain but <laughs> not going there <laughs> Um, I can really believe in that. In fact, you know, uh, companies, uh, Google and other Bitcoin, they all started with, you know, taking uh, processing power from different machines across the world. And now what we're trying to do is we're going to take the processing power of the human brain from across the world to solve a particular problem. In fact, uh, I would share this with you in detail later, sir. But I'm I'm working on a project uh, which is based on this, where we, we invite people from all over the world to solve certain mm-hmm. problems especially in the social sector. Yeah. But amazing note to conclude the interview sir it was an amazing discussion one of the most uh, thought provoking di- discussions that I've had on my show. Uh, thank you so much for this and thank you so much for taking out time and being on this show with me. Thank you so much sir it was fantastic you asked fantastic questions. I have never been asked those kind of questions before and I love the conversation I mean, it's a thought provoking obviously and the questions were fantastic really appreciate it. thank you